long before 74 AD. The sun rose each morning over the Dead Sea and shone light on each new era's uncertainty and change and hope. And not until that year would this mountaintop be remembered for its great act of defiance. Together, 960 people prefer death rather than slavery. Over 1900 years later, the mountain has been overcome with the power of peace in a region that swelters with each day's sun. One artist feels that power, yearns for peace, and says it in a song. For after 100 years of war, we haven't and will not lose hope, and things will be all right. Ieto. As the sun rises June 30th, 2007, 2,000 music lovers embrace the power of David Broza in a sunrise concert at Masada. Watch now as we take a look into the inner workings of what it takes to put on this sunrise concert. This time an international televised event, the mountain, the preparation, the people, and David Broza and his relentless dedication to his music and his culture. A pop icon in the late 70s and through the 90s, David Broza was a household name in Israel, scoring more than 16 gold and multi-platinum records. He is admired now by the young and still by the old. He is approachable, drives a modest car, performs over 200 engagements a year, is his own roadie, and is rarely separated from a cell phone. Hello. Hey, you got a call. Somebody <laughs> wants to talk to you. <laughs> Who is this tireless 51-year-old rock legend? Just ask him. Who is David Broza? Dan, I'm still asking that myself. This is a song for the aftermath, not for the, not while you're at it, you know? David Broza is like anybody, making a lot of mistakes, having a lot of questions, a lot of dreams, a lot of wishful thinking. But one thing he has is that he will not tire to reach those goals, regardless of whether they're right or wrong, whether he fails or whether he triumphs. Just continues doing his own thing and playing his music. That music strapped to his back rarely leaves his side. The inspiration from a performing mother and the countryside where he was born. Behind me is the glorious, wonderful, panoramic view of Tel Aviv, the metropolis. I would say probably the most throbbing, most vitalized, interesting, decadent, unique, and chaotic city outside of New York. Being a kid in Tel Aviv is, you know, it's not like growing up in the valley. It's not the Bronx. First of all, it's Mediterranean. There's a lot of sea. There's a lot of sun, there's a lot of sky. And as a kid, I remember growing in my parents' house where I'm actually still living right now. And it was surrounded then by orchards, orange groves, had watering pools to which Arab villagers would come with it, literally come with their sheep. And I would make friends with the, with the Arab kid who was either in charge of the sheep that day or the son of the shepherd. We had this kind of a, uh, almost a pioneering uh, uh, quality to it. David didn't realize his pioneering days would set the stage for a kinder, more peaceful person, for making friends with the other side of the watering pool. It empowered him, he says, to communicate with music. When I was 12, my parents moved to Madrid, Spain, and um, the first music that I actually got to play and listen was actually more Jimi Hendrix or 
sitting on a dock of a bay, Otis Redding. The only music that would be really the background to my life was, was the music that was played at home. My, my mother was Israel's first folk singer, Sharona Aaron, she was. She played um, Spanish guitar, just like I do. I used to uh, you know, watch other people play, and I started playing. And it was a $100 guitar, it was kind of a cheap guitar, made by Contreras which is still the same guitar I play today, except today it's a grand classical, the best that Contreras makes. At 13, David and some friends from school in Madrid started a garage band. Naturally, we played The Doors, Hendrix, Bob Dylan, stuff like that. Um, and I never thought I'd write music. I never, never really believed that I was going to be any good. In October 1974, David, now 18, returned to Israel for military service, required of everyone that age. One and a half years into a three-year stint, David found himself confused, losing interest in the patriotic. Somebody offered me a, uh, to change phase within the army and, and, and enter the entertainment corps. And but I was entertaining soldiers. See, I didn't play anything but Paul Simon, Dylan, Hendrix. And in 1977, when I finally left the military service, I got an offer by an Israeli uh, poet by the name of Jonathan Giffen. David became a sideman, writing songs with Jonathan for his weekly stage show. The show was controversial for its day, political, sensitive. They watched the world turn and composed for it a song that would become almost a second national anthem. The arrival of President Sadat to Israel in 1977, in November, and as we watched that, um, that incredible moment when he set foot on Israeli soil for the first time and it inspired a song that Jonathan Geffen wrote about that moment and presented to me and said let's write the music to it and let that be our song of the week you know here comes the president of Egypt how happy was I to receive him pyramids in his eyes oh and peace in his pipe he used to smoke pipe and he says come let's let's live together let's make peace and we say great and he says yes but just pull out of the conquered territories. And then, they, and then everything will be all right. And it's all right. Lo and behold, you know, this became my first recorded song. It became an instant number one on the radio and has since then become Israel's peace anthem, which is called Yetov, which means things will be better. And oddly, sadly, and fortunately, all together, it's the one song I can't get off stage without, without singing every night. Four albums and five years later, David had become a legend in Israel. And then he left. There were new horizons. There was Spain, the United States, a claim around the world. But it wasn't home. It wasn't here. And so he returned to this iconic stronghold of his ancient people. Is what? The Israelites and the people of Israel saw, you know, 3,000 years ago when Moses led them through the desert and they stood right there in the, in the mountains across from the Dead Sea here, in the Moab mountains overlooking the Promised Land. So we are actually looking over to the last place where Moses had brought the Israelites. So there's a lot of magic here, unspoken, unspoken magic. What David needed was someone to share his vision. Here he is. David calls him the mountain man. He is the one who's opened up the site for me to set up my crazy idea, doing a sunrise concert, which is not my idea originally. Some others have done it before, but it seems that I happen to have the ingredients to connect and to become the soundtrack for the Masada sunrise. Um, so Ethan Campbell is a man who understands and knows the spirit of this place, the geography of it, archaeological aspects of it, and it runs in his blood. I'll tell you what Masada means to me. We have an incredible geographical formation, a plateau, mountain on the edge of the Judean desert, overlooking the Dead Sea Basin, the lowest place on Earth. We're up here 1,200 feet. And without understanding anything in the archaeology and the, uh, and the heritage of the site, it's already something that hits the heart. Who is Ethan Campbell? Damn. 
the last Mohican. He's a man whose background goes all the way back to Pennsylvania, further back to Scotland, and Eitan has grown to be the director of this place and is the mastermind of the new museum and the whole complex that has been built to receive all the, all the millions and millions of tourists that have been coming here and that will be coming here. They come to experience the story of what happened here. In the year 70, Jerusalem was destroyed this was the end of the Jewish rebellion. There were 960 rebels, a mishmash of refugees that had converged on Masada, having no place else to go, hiding from the might of the Roman Empire. This is where they defied the, their destiny. For months, the rebellious stronghold held out as the Roman army slowly built a ramp to surmount the top of the mountain and conquer the Jewish rebels. And not for the first time in history, the rebels predicted their own fate. Together, 960 people prefer death rather than slavery. Josephus, who tells us the story of Masada, uh, says that the Romans find no pleasure in what they see, even though it be done to their enemies. And they had a great respect for the courage that these people had, uh, had. So, And interestingly, Masada falls on the evening of Passover. This is a Jewish holiday where we celebrate our exit from slavery into freedom, to this day. I don't think there are enough words to explain what Masada does to you. When I decided to become a professional musician, my dream and my vision was to create something that would be so compelling and so um, riveting and interesting that I'd be able to bring the world over to here. To hear it? You know, H-E-R-E. -E. David wants the message of his Sunrise concert to reach millions. His special guest performers are Jackson Brown and Sean Colvin. A plan is put in motion to videotape the performances, to be broadcast later on public broadcasting stations throughout the United States and selected networks throughout the world. PBS executive producer Nicolette Ferry at WTTW. David's been doing concerts at Masada for 14 years, and I, he wanted the world to see Masada. And when I met him eight years ago, I knew that I wanted to work with him again. I knew nothing about him. I never heard of him. So I didn't, didn't know what to expect. The minute the man walked on stage, played his first note, my jaw dropped. And every single person that has seen him has the same reaction. When I came over to PBS to do my show, and they got so excited, he said, it'd be interesting for us to do a special with you. We have a great stage here, a sound stage. Come with your guitar and tell us, you know, we'll do a concert. I, I thought, that's a great idea, but it isn't as great as what I would like. I said, why don't you come and do the special here? I said, Masada. I flew out to Israel to see the midnight concert at Masada, and I had the same experience I had all over again. The jaw drop. And it was just David and his guitar. The sun rose. I had tears streaming down my face at sunrise. His words and his music are so powerful. And I said, this is the place, this is the music, this is the artist. Masada welcomes another sunrise. A hundred miles from Tel Aviv, a sentinel looking east past the Dead Sea to Jordan. Her majestic beauty rises 1,200 feet. And on the plateau, ruins, palaces, storerooms, dwellings, and a synagogue. To the west, this 1,200-seat amphitheater, used for an evening light and sound show, will be converted to 2,000 seats. Power, lighting, portable tents, and television equipment will be delivered. David visits Masada one more time and takes one last look around before preparations begin in earnest. Tel Aviv, David's schedule is more 
politicians than musicians. Production staff from PBS arrive in Tel Aviv. This face-to-face -face meeting with David is the first in over two months. Three incredible shows. Is that good or bad? No, it's great. Then across town for an on-camera interview with a local video channel. To help promote the Masada concert, David appears in person at Ynet, an online chat service where he fields questions from fans around the world. And I will come back now, okay? <laughs> As David is changing locations, Masada's location is changing. unbearable heat and our crew. I was really worried about the crew because when the equipment came in, it came in on semis and then you have to transport the equipment to the stage site. Crew call was at five, got to the mountain at six because we're staying at the Dead Sea, which is an hour away. They worked from six till noon, took a break and then started it up again late afternoon because it was so intense. Is you to work at night in the daytime? Yeah, probably in the desert. <laughs> because we are in the desert, uh, uh, it's home here, you know. You have to yeah. walk in the, in the night. Hey, rock and roll has been, you know, happening everywhere in the world. They've done it upside down, inside out. You know, here's one place that rock and roll has not tried its, its charm and its strength. Big sun, big sky, big wind, a lot of dust. You know, rock and roll was never a clean business. If you're gonna some, raise some dust, do it where the dust is like really tough and real pure. <laughs> and I'm not kidding you. As preparations continue, David takes time at home to walk his dog through the neighborhood where he grew up. He reminisces. We used to play here a lot. I mean, the, the street was full of kids always. This was Kasutsky, this is my grandfather, this is Bauman, this is Rabin and Pundik and Shag and Pekir and Svirsky and you know, everybody. We used to build tree houses here on those big trees. Get in a lot of trouble because we used to steal electricity from neighboring houses as, as kids. You know, shepherds coming up with their, sh with their sheep just up the street here up over there to water their, their flocks. Arab kids from an Arab village nearby. Some of us made friends with them. And the kindergarten was down the street, and, and everything was very, very close by. It was a tight little neighborhood, you know? Like Santa Monica was a little bit. It was an abandoned German Templar's 
farmland. And my grandfather, who um, started the Jewish Brigade in the British Army, World War II, when he came back with his soldiers, he asked the government to allow him to build a hundred exclusive house for his officers. And that's where the, this neighborhood started in 1948. And then another rehearsal. He's made a commitment to perform on a local television show tomorrow evening. So a long night of practice is ahead. Finally, in the night, to home. Five more days before Masada. Another sunrise at Masada. And each day, busloads of tourists arrive before dawn, watch day break from the summit. Stage crews have worked through the night, have returned to hotels for a well-deserved rest. It's a new day in Masada. The midday heat again delays progress until evening. One more delivery winds up back roads past curious onlookers. Weaving its way, bringing a touch of Hollywood to the mountain. Supimos que iba a suceder, tal como el día we wanted to create something that didn't take away from the mountain, but that helped give magnitude and depth. And the beauty of it is that PBS didn't want this to look like a Las Vegas production. Look at the ruins on top and try and take something, take something that you, would, you wouldn't be surprised to see here. Julian Knowles, the director, wants it to be a musical show and wants the sun to rise and not to find scaffolding and you know what you see in a rock show. We want to respect this place. And I think we succeeded. It was very critical to have the set be pure, to kind of represent what Masada is. And we wanted the set just to be something that would, would be there. It's not, it wouldn't look like something that we created, but something that might just be sitting there for thousands of years. If you go to the top of the mountain from King Herod's time, there are pillars. And when we saw that, we said, that's it. We can hang the lighting on those pillars. Meanwhile, along the coast in historic Jaffa, David's performance schedule includes the weekly musical variety show, Mayumana. All right. From one rehearsal to the television show he rehearsed for yesterday. David keeps his promise to appear on the final episode of a friend's late night talk show. They speak English, they don't ah, understand. They don't understand, okay. <laughs> this is for the Masada. For the Masada. This is gonna be there. Lapid. I'm gonna be the front row. Yeah. <laughs> David's evening has reached a finale. 
He exits the bright lights of the studio to cool down for tomorrow. A hot date with the desert. Next afternoon, stage construction resumes. And a production team ascends high up the mountain to begin pre-taping segments for the television show. Letting it be what it does, I don't even know. 3 p.m., the temperature hovers near 120 degrees. David, do you change drinks every time? Mm -hmm. Yeah, basically every show. But because I'm gonna play the opening, and it's going to, no, and it's going to be, I, I'm changing here and not downstairs because I want the temperature of the string to be in there so that it, so it doesn't, you know, doesn't freak out in the sun. On a previous visit, David Broza imagined this. Singing Billy B in my heart. And you can hear the silence really, it's very... Adam... It's very, I can whisper here. We taped at the North Palace with um, David performed In My Heart. It's a song he co-created and co-wrote with a Palestinian musician friend of his. The lyrics are it's about sharing the land and loving each other and it's just a beautiful haunting rock ballad. With, yeah, but move, moving, when, when the right. one's not singing we're just moving. Well, sticks, but moving. Yeah, exactly. So, in that song there are um, 30 children singing and the children are Palestinian and they are Jewish and they were too, they're too young to bring here in, at three o'clock in the morning so we set up um, on the North Palace over there the choir and David and Ibrahim and they performed. It was just absolutely beautiful. lowest section of the North Palace. It has three tiers. The bottom section looks like a theater, you know, sticking out of the rocks. We take not only close-ups, but we did aerial shots with a helicopter. Working with PBS, I also have to Take, bear in mind that for them this is a TV show and they want to show as much as they can the wonders of this place. justice to this place if we were only taking footage from the show itself. So I think it was very wise to do a sunset um, sets, one on the North Palace and one on the South part of Masada. We recorded the opening number up there with just David alone, which was so beautiful and so moving. It, it, it just sets the context of everything and, and he's performing as the sun sets. So it takes us into the night time for the show. So it's very, very, very special. Where am I? <laughs> <laughs> 
am I? Fulfilling our dreams and the director is happy and the producers are happy and the artist is comfortable and, and all the crew is inspired and everybody feels that they're into something that is quite unique. That's kind of an achievement, you know, so it's been worth every, uh, every minute. The sun travels and defines the lines and shadows of the desert. But at showtime, 3 a.m., lighting will be a big concern. Famed television director Julian Knowles. Light, we had to bring in a lot of lights from all over the place because they weren't quite, a, you know, they weren't necessarily enough. Everything that we could use from here we've used. Julian Knowles is one of the finest and greatest TV rock and roll directors with her long list of artists under her arm all the way from from you two to Elton John, Beyonce, everybody that you could ever dream of listening to. If it's windy, then we just have to make a decision to break it down before the show starts. Nicolette called me and just said, we want to go and do a show in the middle of a desert, in the middle of Israel, in the middle of a war zone. What, are you going to do it? I went, yes, of course, let me see. So it was um, out of the blue and it was exciting. I was thrilled. <laughs> Like a traveling roadshow, cases of equipment are brought in. A television studio in the middle of nowhere. Because we're shooting high definition, I've got 10 cameras, which we're using over the two nights. We've got all the record machines, 55 tapes, hundreds of meters of cables to get cameras all over the place. Lights, we had to bring in a lot of lights. I'm using six Israeli camera guys who are completely brilliant, really, really good. I brought in my sort of key team with me. I've got my own camera guys and AD. It's a very multinational crew. People from the States, people from Norway, people from Israel, people from England, it's, it's brilliant. We are the peace process. <laughs> And David breaks his hectic schedule for a brief pilgrimage west to the old city of Jerusalem. Here is the center of the soul the stones of the Western Wall to absorb the energy, the comfort, somewhere between hand and rock. At this very moment, I feel like I would, like I know myself, I feel humbled that all these things happened because I did the right things and I connected in a good way with the integrity that I was able to summon in myself. And I, you know, without getting all religious and all this, because I'm not, I just say, I'm humbled. And this is only the beginning. We have David, David Broza. This is David Broza, Baruch Hashem. No. He used to be, you know, just a secular Jew, and now he's a very religious one, and he's come back to the book, so he knows my music from before, because now he cannot indulge in pop music and light stuff. And then he takes a bolder journey, east, past the edge of Jerusalem, to a place few Israelis venture. David crosses the line to the West Bank. He's been invited to a peace rally of both Israelis and Palestinians. Who are my partner to negotiate with? And I tell them that as long as Olmert is working against peace, he will never be our partner either. From the West Bank border to the shore of the Mediterranean sea town of Jaffa, 
David prepares for another sold-out performance with the dancing musical cast of Mayumana. A whirlwind day catches up. Less than 24 hours to showtime, and another three-hour drive from Tel Aviv to Masaba. Howdy, guys. David and his band arrived to greetings. I'm very well. Some high winds. And he is hoping now the realization of a nine-year dream. This is what I expected. This was my vision. This is what I been trying to tell PBS for the past eight or nine years, we're coming to the mountain right now. Instead of the mountain coming to you, you come into it and we're slowly going to bring it to you. David takes a moment to let it sink in. Come in. Then looks for approval from his biggest fan. So? It looks really cool, that looks it's sick. Outrageous. His son, Adam. I'm extremely proud of my dad, yeah. Life. I don't think he knew exactly that it would come out to this, to, to reach exactly this event in the way that it is, but I think that it is, in the end, what he would have wanted to do, and I don't think it'll be the last sort that he'll do, but I definitely think my dad has hit like a landmark in his career at this point. Finishing touches are being made on and around the stage. Lighting. Instruments. And for television, technical checks. Okay, that's, that, can you mark David's position? Just hours to show time. After dinner and a shower, David sets foot at Masada. This is it. Moment of truth is right. This is what King Herod had in mind, that this place should only know good times. <laughs> so far. By now, most of Israel is fast asleep. Here, the desert is wide awake. Can we try it right in the soundtrack anyway? I'll tell you why. So that Peter can get a sense. Do you we're, know what? We're, we're does it, does the it matter to you what I play on those 60 bars? Mm -hmm. Or you just want me to play? I'd like it to be nice in Masada. Masada is literally a glow. Fine tuning the details heightens the activity. Hey. The best seats in the world for the sunrise. Now I gotta prove myself. They brought it to me and said, hey Brosa, now you take the stage. All yours. And that's that's when I'm getting a little nervous now. And somehow, it's time for a nap. And now, a sound check. Hey, 
קונגס, כל הפרקשן הרבה יותר. תעשה את זה עם דרבוקה. דרבוקה? מה שתגיד? כי ההוא זה כלי מאוד בעייתי פה באירוח הזה. For the next two evenings, buses deliver 2,000 people for each sold-out show. The gates open at 2 a.m. and a stream of music lovers pours in. Backstage, where there would be a tour bus, where there would be dressing rooms, there is but a mirage. A few tents, wind, dust. And now, it's time. He has traveled this path to the stage many times. <laughs> This place you might believe the world was dust the wind and sky. Crescendo, the sun. I beat me a hollow, it's a silly day at two. A year ago. There weren't many people that thought I was talking any sense whatsoever. Today I can say, there's a will, there's a way. And lo and behold, we did it. It was amazing. Really enjoyed very much. Very, so very much, much better than I ever thought it would be. Fine. <laughs> but it was fun and beautiful. Look at this. No man can move a mountain. But after years of dreaming and months of planning, an arduous preparation, one man and two concerts, in a way did move the mountain, around the world to thousands of television viewers. This life's full of little joy, 
Things happen sometimes that are nice. Masada has witnessed untold eons. History oozes from the place. King Herod built on it. Israelites died on it. The Roman army surmounted it, tried to destroy it. Masada has its way with people, touches them. And some, with David Broza, feel its power and solace and magnificent wonder. Somebody make me laugh, somebody make me cry. Somebody tell me something my heart can't deny. Somebody make me feel the things I cannot feel. Where's my phone? No, I'm kidding. <laughs>